Somebody sent me this video today. Uh, I didn't really have a video planned, so I figured I'd make a reaction to this. It's not really a reaction. Uh, I, I think it's got some interesting topics here. I have, I've only watched like a couple minutes of it, so let's get started. Welcome back to the Dr. Doug Show, your Welcome resource back. for bone health, hormone optimization, and health span for women midlife and beyond. So today I have a really fun interview to uh, present to you. I met with Morley Robbins. Morley Robbins wrote the book, Cure Your Fatigue. Uh, as far as this topic goes, I actually think it applies to everybody, but I, you know, I haven't gotten too far into this. Uh, this is a book that I read several months ago now, and it's all about iron metabolism, copper, there's a lot in there about vitamin D, but today specifically we're gonna talk about iron and copper. So iron and copper are very relevant to um, the audience of this show because as women go through menopause, there is the potential to start to accumulate iron. The metabolic dysfunction that goes along with that is often misunderstood, it's often missed, how to interpret the labs um, is. My question to this is, and I don't know if they talk about it, is. Uh, males who have weight on them, their fat uh, turns testosterone into estrogen. So they're going to have more characteristics of females too. So maybe they uh, have iron issues as well. I don't know. It's uh, pretty rare to be done and correctly in my opinion. And so we've started incorporating a lot of these uh, principles into our practice and we're seeing some really interesting shifts in biomarkers and how people are feeling. So I want to present this to this audience so you guys can understand this, potentially read this book. Uh, we talk a lot about the labs. So again, as usual, I'm trying to help educate people and empower them to do some of this work on their own because it's going to be difficult to find a provider that can help you to understand these things like Morley talks about them. So stick around for Morley Robbins and I hope you enjoy. All right. Well, Morley, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I, we have so many fun things to talk about. And as I said in the introduction, we have three of these planned. So I want to be um, pretty clear about... Um, what we're going to go what we're going to go through today i want to talk mostly about i'm definitely not going to watch this whole video i just wanted to plant the idea out there and uh just you know i'll, I'll see how long i go out um, iron and copper today but before we dig into that can you give us uh, just a little bit about your background um just how you got into this space because it is a very very unique space yeah and i if someone had told me in my 40s that I would be doing this in my 70s, I'd say, eh, I don't think so. So uh, I was born into a very sickly family, a lot of, a lot of illness. Uh, my sister, older sister, became a nurse. I was supposed to become the doctor until I got to college and found out, wow, this is not easy. So um, I, I did not get into medical school. I, I was only rejected by 18 medical schools. And, uh, and that was a blessing. Uh, because I didn't get indoctrinated, but I did what any um, red-blooded American would do. I went to business school to become a hospital executive so I could boss the doctors around. And I did that uh, for 32 years. I was a executive for 12 and a consultant for 20 and uh, traveled all over the country, making hospitals bigger and better and better. And, uh, but pulled a suitcase behind my back for 20 years through airports, developed frozen shoulder, which mm -hmm. got me to my now wife, who's a chiropractor, who introduced me to innate healing. And she freed up my frozen shoulder by going into the pterygoid muscle inside my mouth with the full weight of her body. And as she pressed, my arm lifted. And that was a miracle. And, uh, and then she used that phrase, innate healer, which I had never heard in 32 years of working in hospitals. And that was my wake up call. I went, if there's, if there's an innate healer, why do we have millions of doctors around the world? And that's what led to. I am a huge proponent of chiropractors, but you got to find the good one. You know, if it's an assembly line kind of chiropractor, it's usually not that great. Uh, so really pick and choose, maybe go to different ones, figure out which ones you like. Uh, insurance usually doesn't cover chiropractors. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So that's on you then. To 15 years of research and the book, Cure Your Fatigue, because in my humble opinion, copper, bioavailable copper, as we'll talk about, is the innate healer 
that is the best kept secret on planet Earth. Beautiful. Well, that's thank you for that history. I hadn't heard you uh, talk about your shoulder like that before. So as a, an orthopedic surgeon, I used to treat frozen shoulder. I can tell you as, <laughs> as you experienced that I don't have a lot to offer <laughs> for that problem. Um, all kinds of things that we can try, um, but none of them work. Well, they wanted to operate, and I said, "No, that's not. Yeah. That's not the solution." Yeah. So, and I've uh, done that. I've done a shoulder scope on somebody with a frozen shoulder, right. and it's a it's a disaster in there, and they don't really get better. Um, so it's a it's a really tough problem. So um, I did not learn that therapy, it's sticking my finger in someone's mouth. Oh, it's amazing. So, <laughs> so, it's very so, painful. Very painful. I, I would imagine. Yeah, but so is frozen shoulder. So you're in good company with yourself. Um, yeah. All right. So let's just talk about. Um, before we get into copper, I want to I want to hit the iron side of this, and um, this is an area I see a lot. This is definitely not going to be too much of a reaction video because I mean, you know, the information's decent, probably. Who knows? We'll see. Odd and, and early on in practice because but I, I don't want to just let it play because then they can copyright me. And working with people, specifically with osteoporosis, we have a, a lot of women perimenopause, menopause. It's the the majority of our practice. This is a time in a woman's life where they are very frequently diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia. Right. So when I started treating my patients, I was looking at specific biomarkers, which we'll talk about. Um, and mm -hmm. I would say, oh, you're iron deficient. I think you would feel better with more mm -hmm. iron. Right. Now, when I read your book, it blew my mind, like probably true for most physicians that would read it. Um, mm -hmm. It basically, what you were telling me is that iron deficiency is probably not iron deficiency, and we need to look at this a totally different way. So let me start by framing this with why do why do we look at iron the way that you do? And to say that another way, why is iron a problem more often than it is a, a deficiency? Why do we have likely too much iron to begin with? Right. Yeah, great question. Um, again, I think it's important for the listener to understand that there's a difference between low iron in a blood test versus high iron in the tissue. And the blood test does not matter. It's the same way with magnesium. It's really hard to diagnose low magnesium. Measure the tissue up. It's very, very important. We've been trained to think that blood is a perfect representation of the body. It's not. It's a perfect representation of the blood. Right. And that's that's the critical distinction, blood versus tissue. And <clears throat> there's important research that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, there was a he's a world renowned um, physiologist named Bruce Ames. Um, at the peak of his career, he was the most quoted scientist on planet Earth. He was at Berkeley for over 30 years and um, he and one of his colleagues, um, Dr. Camellia, did a study in 2004 looking at iron in the blood versus iron in the tissue. And what they found was that there was 10 times more iron in the tissue than showed up in the blood. That's a big deal. 10 times more. That, that really I mean, if that's the case and they got you supplementing iron, that would be not great. Research should have reverberated through uh, medical schools all over the planet, but it didn't. Uh, it, it's stored with the Ark of the Covenant in the Indiana Jones warehouse. And so nobody knows about that research. And so the meme that runs medicine on the planet is you're anemic and you're copper toxic. Right. Those two metals have been set in opposition to each other. And, and it's, you know, you tell a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. And people are convinced that they're anemic because of the blood test. The only way you can find out the tissue level is either a needle biopsy of the liver, it's very painful, you first, or a, a Tesla II MRI, it's very expensive, again, you first. But they're very accurate at telling you what the tissue level of iron is. And it gets us out of this... Um, kindergarten-esque perspective of the blood. And the, the truth of the matter is that we're swimming in iron, which gets back to your very question. We're swimming in iron because we lack sufficient 
exposure to copper in our diet. And what I've pieced together, and I'm I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, I've I've been studying the research now for 15 years, going back to the late 1800s. Uh, copper was first identified in 1875. It's like okay, that's intriguing, but they didn't really understand it until the early 1910s, 19 teens, and um, and then there was a a real rush by by uh, physicians and scientists to understand the dynamic between copper and iron as it relates to making energy, getting inside the mitochondria, and understanding how ATP is really made. There was there were no other minerals that they were thinking about, and I know. If you do take copper, and I'm sure they talk about it, um, you got to take zinc. Otherwise, you're going to have an upset uh, gut. We're going we're gonna to circle back yeah. to zinc. But zinc wasn't even on the, the radar screen. It was, yeah, we'll, it was we'll, circle, we'll circle back there. I, one, some yeah. of the things that really stood out to me in reading your book and now as I'm looking at my patients is understanding that we are exposed to a tremendous amount of iron. And I, I want you to explain this because I'll get the statistics wrong. But help me and the listeners to understand how how much iron we're exposed to both in our environment, in our food, but through also through through supplemented forms um, and uh, through products which we prefer it not to be. Uh, but then also through you know heme iron through meat and then non heme iron through through vegetables. Give us a sense of how much iron we're exposed to, and then the flip side of that is how much of that iron we. There is a ton of it in uh, potatoes too, and that might be why my hemoglobin is, is like um, over the high range. It was like eighteen point two the last time I had it tested. We are actually generally absorbing. Right, great, great question. So, in order to answer that question, let me explain something called the iron recycling program that we have in our body. Yeah, um, I'm sure that when you were in school, they talked about the reticulo endothelial system, the RES. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me two years to figure out that that meant recycling. It's really important. And so every second of every day, we need to replace two and a half million red blood cells. Every second. So it means we've got to take two and a half million offline. We've got to make two and a half million new ones. So the, the ones that are being taken offline, those are coming out of our spleen for the most part. The ones that are coming online are coming out of the bone marrow. The bone marrow is found in our uh, femurs, our hips, our um, you know other, other long bones that, that have that capacity to make new red blood cells. Two and a half million a second. So we've been talking now for about ten minutes. That's right? a lot. That's, That's a lot of red blood cells. That is crazy. It's a lot of red blood cells in the course of twenty-four hours. In the course of twenty-four hours, it's two hundred billion red blood cells. Now, what will surprise you? is to find out how much iron it takes to support the replacement of 200 billion red blood cells. Now, mind you, the red blood cells, the hemoglobin inside those red blood cells, and there's bazillions of hemoglobin inside one red blood cell, but, but the amount of iron in 200 billion red blood cells is 25 milligrams. Wow. The average, the average adult has over 5,000 milligrams of iron. 25 is just a little tiny bit of iron. Now here's what will shock you. 24 of those 25 milligrams comes from this recycling system, the reticulo endothelial system, that's really um, regulated by the spleen. It's a critically important organ. It's known as the hidden organ. Nobody knows about it, or the forgotten organ. Right. But, but right. the point is, 24 of the 25 milligrams are coming from the recycling system that's run by copper. Nobody knows about that. And we need one milligram of iron in our diet every day to make up for that additional milligram. Yeah. Well, the average... The average person, certainly the average American, let's, let's just stay within the, the continental U.S. And, um, we're, we're getting uh, probably between 25 to 75 milligrams of iron a day. 
It's it, it's an enormous multiple of the one that we need. Right. When you think about the iron fortification, iron supplementation, iron infusions that people are getting, there's a, a wholesale flooding of iron because of the perception of... I'm, I, I usually do more reactions, but it's just not happening. Iron deficiency anemia. Well, it's ridiculous, though. Maybe that's why they probably know this, and that's probably why it's in the system so heavy. Probably coming out of the sky, too. As opposed to the anemia of chronic inflammation, that's a completely different beast. Mm -hmm. The latter form of anemia is a result of lack of bioavailable copper, not lack of iron. And so when, when copper is down, what happens is... Actually, in my last blood test, my copper was down. The body starts to accumulate iron. It starts to store iron. Where does it store it first and foremost? Is in our liver. And as the iron starts to get stuck in our liver, it doesn't show up in the blood test, does it? And that's... Not, what, a, not as iron, no. Not as iron. It's just right. Very good point. And then what happens is <clears throat> blood test comes back, iron looks looks low, nobody's thinking about the, the liver, nobody's thinking about the heart, nobody's thinking about the pancreas, the kidney, the brain, wherever, where, where the iron is building quietly in the ferritin protein. And what people need to realize is that every facet of iron metabolism runs and is regulated at the discretion of bioavailable copper. And so the, the reason why this blood is so important is that 70% of the iron in our body is tied up in the hemoglobin of the blood. 70%. If we, if we incorporate myoglobin, we're up to 80% of the iron. So this, there's enormous bolus of iron in this recycling system that we're so dependent upon. But no one's thinking about that when they see a low blood test. So right. iron in blood, and they think, instinctively, oh, I need more iron. And the food system is designed to make sure that you get that additional incremental iron. And they've, what they've done also, beyond just iron fortification, Doug, is they've, they've changed, they've modified seeds. So when I was, I was born in 1952. So I was a little boy, I watched Popeye, right? Every, every little kid watched Popeye. Right. And what did he love to eat? Spinach, right? He'd, he'd squeeze the can and the spinach would go up in the air and he'd swallow it. Well, spinach back then had a uptake of copper. It's been hybridized now that it takes up iron. It doesn't mm. take up copper. Yeah, so exactly. that's not just, that's not the only vegetable or, or, or food item that's been modified to right. have a preferential uptake of iron. So we are now swimming in iron in our diet, we're not really aware of it, and the, the body depends on that iron, can't live without it, but it, the, the way the Chinese think about it is they call the copper the general and iron is the foot soldier, the grunt. Right. What do generals have? They have more stars on their shoulder, right? Stars mm -hmm. are made of brass. What's brass made of? Copper. Copper. And so the general runs the show quietly in the background and everyone is taught to focus on iron uh, at their discretion. Yeah. So before we get into copper, uh, two, I think a really important point for people that are trying to figure this out, if this sounds mind blowing to them, um, which is, uh, so two things. One is the only way to get rid of iron is to bleed it out, right? So whether this is, you know, a cycling woman through her, her monthly cycle or yeah. through phlebotomy for those of us that don't have that. Um, and then the other component of that is what happens in the tissues with iron that is building up? Well, what's the downside here? How, how much time do we have? <laughs> Give me the short version. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a, a storage protein that I've once heard of, ferritin, iron storage protein. <clears throat> and that, as, as iron begins to build, it, technically that each, uh, it's a nano cage, little tiny little tiny circle that holds 4,500 atoms of iron, up to 4,500. Um, and believe it or not, 
that ferritin is like an ATM machine. Put iron in, take iron out. Put iron in, take iron out. And that function of in and out runs at the discretion of bioavailable copper. There's an enzyme called ferrooxidase. Ferro, iron, oxidase. Let's use oxygen to engage it. And it turns, it's able to turn iron into a form that can be inserted in and taken out. Critical, critical function. If that protein, ferritin, becomes denatured, what does that mean? Destroyed. But what's, what it really means is copper loses its bioavailability. Then it becomes something called hemosiderin. You may recall hemosiderin from your training. Yeah. Well, hemosiderin holds 10 times more iron than ferritin, but it's never measured in a blood test. Did you know that? No one ever measures hemosiderin. No, we just, and, we, we look for hemosiderin staining, you know, on... Hemosiderin staining, right? Yeah. But you didn't know that there was 10 times more iron in each molecule of hemosiderin. Right. Uh, only, only two authors that I know of that talk about hemosiderin, Shogren from 1953 and Sato from 20, 2014. That's a 60 mm. year gap between those two authors. Only two that I've ever found that talked about hemosiderin. That should make your toes curl. And the thing is, if, if the iron is continuing to build in the body, because it's not being properly regulated, that iron becomes magnetic. And what I've been immersing myself in in the last week, just in the last week, I've been, I've been at this for 15 years, but in the last week, the, the universe decided, Morley, you're ready to learn about the dark side of iron. And it's called magnetoferritin. Have you ever heard of it? No. No. This is this is pretty deep. I don't know. I might um I might watch for a little while longer and then I'm just gonna link this video down below and you can go check it out because I'm essentially just watching it here. It's I'd, like a copyright. I'd be issue. shocked if you had. I'd be really impressed if you had, but I would be shocked <laughs> as well. But the thing is, magnetoferritin has magnetic qualities, very powerful magnetic qualities, that is now considered to be the force behind cardiovascular disease, cancer, and neurodegeneration. Not mm. my theory. There's some really bright minds that are working on this. Now, when did they first know this was a problem? 1958. When did it first get prominent scientific recognition? 1992. Mm. Kirschvink et al., 1992, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That's when it first came on the scene as a uh, Houston we have a problem, and now, 30 years later, they're still fumbling, trying to figure out why is it happening and how do we stop it? And pardon me, but there's only one way to stop it, and that's to get more bioavailable copper inside the human being that requires the general to run the grunts. And it's a very simple concept that within the military, people get it. Within medicine, not so much. Yeah. And so, and my understanding too is that iron in general is um, very oxidative. It, it responds, mm -hmm. it interacts with oxygen very readily. And right. it, when, when present in tissues results in a lot of oxidative stress, is that right? Is, is that a, a very simplified way of saying some of this? Very simplified. It's okay. that iron and oxygen have a magnetic attraction for each other and they love to create rust. This guy loves this subject. I just need him to get around to it. Um, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I can't, I couldn't watch this video all the way through. So I'm looking over here at the chapters. I'm going to link this video down below. Go watch it. It is good information, but I just feel like the deliverance could be done already. Like, could be, like, I understand interviews are supposed to be a little bit longer. Maybe this is just me being me. Anyways. Uh, comments, questions down below. I'd like to look more into this because I am actually somebody with he uh, high hemoglobin and never had high, uh, low iron or anything. My, it's always, uh, fairly high. My ferritin's always fairly high. So that is interesting to me. Anyways, talk to you in the next one.